welcome to the show. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the big story of the week is definitely this. The coronavirus crisis is unfolding at a dramatic pace today. It's starting to mutate and spread further. The mysterious illness has now killed four people. 17 people. 26. 41. 56. 80 people. More than 100. The virus has reached Australia. Japan, Thailand, Vietnam. The US. Northern Ireland. Edinburgh. France. And now Canada. Globally, this is a, a real concern. It's terrifying. A week ago, if someone sneezed, you're like, bless you. <laughs> now, you're like, stay the fuck <laughs> away from me, you snuffly fuck. <laughs> Still, it's not like it's here at Sky. People can be spreading infection without knowing they even have it. Well, as Paul Kelso was explaining, the authorities in China have taken strong action to try to contain the spread of the virus. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Crazy. Have you seen how China are dealing with it? China locked on. 56 million people effectively quarantined as the country's president says the spread of the coronavirus is accelerating. 56 million. That is the population of England. Imagine trying to control that. <laughs> it's hard enough controlling a stag do. <laughs> Don't drink that. Don't eat that. Don't put your dick in that. <laughs> And that's just at the airport. <laughs> but the Chinese are different. They're still going to work. And the precautions they are taking are mad. <laughs> <laughs> They're office workers, not leftovers. <laughs> Why are they sleeping in Tupperware? <laughs> Good night, darling. Click, click, <laughs> click, click. Sleep well. <laughs> Now, what was that? <laughs> now, if you think they're dedicated, check out the doctors. Medics treating coronavirus victims are wearing adult nappies as they do not have time to use the toilet. Imagine that. Am I going to die? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't joke. I shouldn't joke. As many as 100,000 people might already be infected. Don't cough. <laughs> it's no wonder that face mask supplies have run out across Asia. It's got so bad, some people have had to improvise. <laughs> Let's hope that's not used. Even people. <laughs> Sorry, but even people who do have masks don't exactly know how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. I wonder, I wonder, Russ, how British people living in China are coping. How do you think? What are your plans in the light of events? Well, I, I, I've had a... I've got some whiskey here. <laughs> I'm gonna get bollocks! <laughs> Fuck the coronavirus, I'm gonna get Stella Belly. <laughs> If I am going to vomit, it will be on my terms. Thank you very much. <laughs> the whole story is insane. I mean, did you see how it started? Coronavirus could have been spread by bat soup. <gasps> oh, indeed, madam. <laughs> you think the headline's bad? Wait till you see it. <laughs> <laughs> wet dream. <laughs> Holy, why would you? <laughs> I'd rather eat from that doctor's nappy. It gets... <laughs> it, it gets stranger. Look what else you can buy at the food market where the virus started. Animals available sale include live foxes, crocodiles, wolf puppies, giant salamanders, snakes, rats, peacocks, porcupines and koalas. That's not a market. That's Attenborough's wank bank. <laughs> Look, I shouldn't... 
I shouldn't take the piss. In the next week, over a thousand people could die from this virus. Is anyone else thinking what I'm thinking? We send this man to cover the story. <laughs> Try the suit. <laughs> Try the suit. He's the perfect choice. He proved that this week. He's very good with the language. I only drink yang yang dong dong yang ming ming. No. <laughs> no. Yes. Racism. Now, some of the things the Chinese government are doing to help are crazy. Did you know they are playing motivational messages through loudspeakers in the sea? <laughs> Yeah, well, it would it? I think I'm dying. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> There's blood coming out of my eyes. Live every day as if it's your last. <laughs> it fucking is! <laughs> it's mad. But then... But then they have a track record of mental reactions to public health. Recently in China, air pollution has killed more than a million and a half people a year. So, what did they do? They put out this. Smile and try to be positive. Hopefully, there'll be less smog tomorrow. <laughs> Keep calm and carry on choking. <laughs> Christ, what other posters have they got? Paedophiles, at least your kid will be fit. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably thinking, leaflets. How ridiculous. We'd never do that. Guess again. Passengers at Heathrow say they were given a leaflet and waved through despite coronavirus fear. Well, I can't wait to see those. <laughs> now, moving on, it turns out the coronavirus is not the only threat to mankind. Male sex robots with unstoppable bionic penises are coming this year. <laughs> Don't cheer that. Don't cheer that. <laughs> no! Why? Yeah, what? <laughs> See, that's why we're in the state we are. <laughs> you got a cure for the virus? No, but we do have a robot with a dick like a jackhammer. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Who wants a bionic penis that's unstoppable? <laughs> How did Nan die in ecstasy? <laughs> Do you know the weirdest thing about this robot? He looks like me! <laughs> it's awful! <laughs> Pose for a mannequin, they said. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be a Madame Two Swords. They've turned me into <laughs> fucking Robocock. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, back in Britain, it's been a huge week on Teesside. Teesside was struck by an earthquake registering 2.8 on the Richter scale. Tim's house is right on top of the epicenter. I felt nothing was slept through the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> Some of the eyewitness reports couldn't have been more British if they tried. My ensuite door, which was closed, shook. <laughs> Another said their budgie was very alert and didn't eat his breakfast. <laughs> But this was my favourite. One resident said they felt their bed shake before the headboard banged against the wall. <laughs> I think we all know what's happened there. <laughs> Sounds like Granny's rigged up this guy. <laughs> uh, now, talking, talking of the earth moving, did anyone hear about this? Pensioner sex confessions leave this morning viewers gobsmacked. I'm not surprised. This lady is 80 years old, and here she is discussing her first night with her 35-year-old lover. The first night, pretty rough. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough. I'd been... Nobody had been near, near me for 35 years. I thought I was a virgin again. Oh, really? Anyway, <laughs> but, um, can I say what we use? A whole tube of KY jelly? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can say that. We can say that. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I couldn't walk the next day. <laughs> I felt as if I'd been riding a horse. <laughs> Saddle sore wasn't in it. <laughs> Why not, madam? Why not? Now, moving on. 
Man who robbed bank wearing pillowcase without eye holes, arrested after fleeing very slowly and stopping to pat a dog. <laughs> it's just brilliant, isn't it? Just that. Uh... Hello? <laughs> Lovely dog. <laughs> what breed are you? Police dog? <laughs> Not that he's the worst criminal in the news. In London, three guys tried to take a woman hostage and rob her jewellery shop. Fair to say, didn't go great. The robbery is now underway, but she's able to run off. She presses a panic button, which calls the police and locks herself in the toilet. Now, chaos ensues. <laughs> However hard they hit it, the door won't open because, well, it's locked. Finally, one of them remembers there is a release button and runs to press it. His mate makes his escape, but forgets to keep the door open for the others. So, yes, they're locked in again. Listen to this. Unbelievably, there's more. Take two. Run back, open door, keep door open, and then everyone scarpers. Simple, really. Well, not quite. <laughs> you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking that's the end of it. Oh, no. Take three. The last crook presses the button and tries to rush back in time. But he's a bit out of shape and not quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> One of them got seven years in prison. And that's not all. Apparently, this is his cellmate. <laughs> Join me after a break when I'll be talking testicles. Essentially, when I was 15, I discovered lump on my testicle and I didn't tell anyone for three years. Yeah. Which um, is such a bloke thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Just go, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'll yeah. just ignore it. Uh, it'll, it'll go away on its own. It'll be grand. And by the time I did tell someone, it had grown to the size of a can of Coke. Aye. Welcome back to the show. Now it's time for Playground Politics. This week, I spoke to the kids about being an adult. Before we start, you just have to promise me that this sector of the show will be appropriate for kids, because I know that, the, that most of your shows are that thing. They are that thing. Yeah, th this is going to be appropriate for kids. Occasionally, it might get a bit like that, but normally it's the kids. <laughs> Are you looking forward to being an adult? Well, just to let you know, not really. What do you think you'll be doing in 10 years' time? I, I would buy a car. Nice. And I, and I have some fun driving around me, meeting my friends. Yes, I can see you now. Hot day. You having the roof down? Mm. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> What are you most looking forward to doing as an adult? Just, like, running a business. Nice. How about you? I like the saying, yeah, you know what I mean? The naughty words. <laughs> so a guy um, rushed in front with his bike with a gun and the guy said uh, the swear word. He said, um, see, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. See word. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, that's big. So how did you start out, actually? Um, I used to do gigs when I was 18. Gigs? What does that mean? So I would turn up and I would try out jokes for free in a pub. How about you just charge the bartender? That isn't the way it works. You have to kind of work for free before somebody says, yep, you're good enough, here's 50 pounds. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Who do you admire? Like, what famous person would you want to be when you were up? Yeah. Tom Hanks. You, wow. You want to be Tom Hanks? Yeah. But have you ever seen him in Castaway? Basically, Tom Hanks lives in an island on his own, but he becomes best friend with the volleyball. I take back Tom Hanks. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. I'd like to be a computer game designer. Oh, nice. I just... not really good at programming yet. How old are you? I'm nine. Yeah, you're right, it's a bit late. I think a teacher's the best job because Mr Fernandez is the best teacher. Oh, really? What makes Fernandez such a good teacher? He's funny. Uh huh? He's nice. Caring. And he's Spanish. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So 
first guest this week is a comedian and actor whose hit theatre show has been turned into a brand new BBC drama. Wait, can you see it through my trousers? Has it? It has. It's definitely gotten bigger. Shit. I'm gonna have to sort it myself. I can try squeezing it. Freezing it. Ooh. Holy water. Gentlemen, please welcome my guest, Michael Patrick. <laughs> so, that wasn't you. No. <laughs> what gave it away? Um, everything. <laughs> but the show is called My Left Nut. Yes. And it's based upon your life story. Yes. And it's now been turned into a show on BBC. Yes. So what happened? So, yeah, as I said, the show's called My Left Knot, uh, based on my experience as a teenager. When I was 15, I discovered lump on my testicle, and I didn't tell anyone for three years. Yeah. Which and is such a bloke thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Just to go, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'll yeah. just ignore it. Uh, it'll, it'll go away on its own. It'll be grand. And by the time I did tell someone, it had grown to the size of a can of Coke. Aye. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine carrying a can of coke around in your pocket at all times. And How was that? Were, were there sort of suspicions? Yeah, oh, so for a while it was quite small, it was grand, but towards the end, like, you could definitely see it through my trousers. Yeah. And there was a lot of rumours going around school yeah. that I was rather well endowed. Yeah. <laughs> which, obviously, as a teenager, I'm like, all right, well, that's a pretty decent rumour to be going around, so, all right. What but, a um, weird energy to be carrying. So, presumably, yeah. you're thinking, I'm, I'm dying. Yeah. This is something terrible, but mm -hmm. the girls think I've got a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> like, and as a teenager, like, do you know exactly that balances? Like, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's... It was scary and it was terrifying, but it also ended up in kind of some funny situations because of it. So, yeah. we, you know, we wanted to share that. And Well, that's what's so interesting about the show, that it is horrific and yet really funny. Yeah, well, it's a show about teenage boys and balls. Mm. Like, you know, that's... <laughs> but it's teenage that's funny, boys, like... Teenage boys, balls and fear. Yeah. And love. Yeah. All kind of wrapped up together. Yeah, and family as well, and love and friendship and all that as well. Um, I think the reason I didn't tell anyone really was a couple of reasons. So my dad passed away when I was eight years old. Right. Of motor neuron disease. Right. And obviously that means the only parent I've got in the house is my ma. Yeah. And who wants to go to their ma yeah. about their testicles, for one? Second thing, obviously, subconsciously, I'm worried that, you know, I saw my dad go through something. Yeah. I don't want to go through that, so then that's the whole thing that I'm like, I don't, I just want to ignore that. So those are the things that are sort of swirling around in my head. And was the there, th there was n nobody that you know, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think, yeah. like a teacher or something like that? Or I mean, you would you go to your teacher? No, about right, man, I'm just, like, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Theoretically, that you, we should all feel comfortable, and yeah. you should feel comfortable with your but teachers. Who does? And, but who does? You know, yeah. it's hard. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I look back now, and I'm like, you're, you're an idiot. You're a fool. Go yeah. to the doctors. Go to the doctors. But as well, at that age as well, you know, when it first happened at 15, you're sort of like, is that supposed to be there? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's just they're growing in a weird rate, and, and then the other one's going to catch up eventually. You know. And to clear up, what was it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it was a hydra seal, which is just essentially a build-up of fluid. Right. That's all it is. So there was, it wasn't cancerous, it was nothing? No, it was just a big load of liquid. That's so, all it was. Like. So you just had, like, a, one massive liquidy ball? Yeah. <laughs> like a big water balloon, like. And like, well, that's the thing, because it wasn't sore, really, because that kind of cushions it. It's like you've got, like, a nice sort of protective layer around it. Yeah. So I wasn't feeling any pain, so I was like, maybe this is all right. Right. So, yeah, it was, it was a very strange time, but at the same time, there was nights where I would cry myself to sleep about it, yeah. and I'd be like, I should tell someone or I should do something, but I was just that, you know, that much of a, you know, typical lad, typical teenager. You know, I have a very loving family, I've got very close friends, yeah. but I still didn't feel comfortable to... Was it ever kind of like, I'm trying to think, like a moment in PE, 
where you know you're in, <laughs> you're in the showers and yeah. someone's like, whoa, man. <laughs> I tried to hide it as much as possible. Like that was the whole thing, awkwardly sort of trying to get changed behind the towel. But there was one moment where obviously you had the sort of classic, really short PE shorts, and I didn't have the most supportive underwear on. Yeah. And we were doing this thing where we're sprinting, and the fella behind you had to try and catch up with you, and they slipped out. Yeah. And your man's reaching for me to try and grab me and just sees these, this pair fall out and, oh, and sort of, he cringes back in horror. Yeah. Thankfully, he was, he was so traumatized, he didn't tell anyone. So he uh, <laughs> managed to keep it secret for a bit longer. So when did you finally decide to tell somebody? Eventually, it just got, it got so big. And it wasn't like, there wasn't a single moment where it was, no, I have to tell someone. It was yeah. sort of a gradual process. And eventually, at first, I told my mum. When I went down, I was like, mum, I need to go to the doctor. He says, why? I says, well, because I've got a swelling on my testicle. And like a classic Irish mother, she went, oh, right, Grant, yes, yes, that's fine. Uh, we'll get that, we'll, we'll get that fixed. <clears throat> and I uh, went to the doctors and because of the sheer size of it, like we got rushed through everything. Yeah. Which then makes you worry yeah. even more because you're like, you know, it's the NHS and they're amazing, but there's waiting lists, you know? So they got me in for ultrasound like a couple of days after and on a Saturday. But it's not a doctor doing the ultrasound, it's like a, it's a technician. Yeah. So I'm sitting to the technician, can you tell me what's wrong? And he says, no, no, I just do the scan and then t pass this on to the doctor. Yeah. And I'm like, but you, come on, you have to tell me something. And he's like, no, because he doesn't, he's you know, not qualified or whatever to, um, to say that. Yeah. And then it was my mate's 18th birthday party that night and he had a free gaff, big house party, parents were away. And I'm sitting there with this feeling of, I've got something wrong with me, I've yeah. tried to get it fixed, I still don't know what it is. And I ended up uh, drinking, you know, two, three liter bottles of cider, vomiting on his front garden and telling the whole party I had cancer. Uh, which, uh, in retrospect, probably wasn't the best way to deal with it. And kind of is... ruined my mate's 18th birthday, so I just want to take this opportunity to apologize to my friend yeah. on television for ruining his birthday. I think you're all right, man. <laughs> <laughs> did you do any of those things in that clip? Did you try I those? I didn't do the deep heat, Yeah. but I thought about it. I think I lifted a tin and was like, do you know what, that's even, even too far. Yeah, but you actually poured holy water on your balls. Well, I didn't pour the thing in. It was more of a, like, a, you're reaching for the holy water anyway, and then you just sort of... <laughs> yeah, we did this thing. Yeah. So, how was it treated in the end? There's two options with that, I was told. Um, they can either insert a needle... No! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it sort of drains out. You know... But, but the issue with that is that... It, the swelling might come back. Yes. In which case, I'd have to needle it again. Uh -huh. And again. Yeah. And again. No. Every time it comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decided not to go for that one. Correct. Uh, and the other option is surgery. So they yes. go in and they have surgery. <laughs> but I was under general anesthetic then, so that was fine. Exactly. You can't yeah. feel it. You can't thing. feel it. And, Fuck yeah. um, Who in their right mind is going for the first one? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I do not know. You'd be, uh, yeah. Would you like to just. So we can put you under and you won't feel a thing and we'll yeah. do a procedure and your test will be back to a normal size. Or we can stab at you. <laughs> <laughs> With a sewing machine. <laughs> and you have to go back every year for the pleasure of it again. Yeah. Yeah. So you just woke up? I woke up and it was all fine. Just had to wait for the stitches to heal and everything's all, all good now. Amazing. Yeah. So what made you go from that kind of trauma yeah. and then go, I'm going to turn this into a stage show? Yeah, so it was a stage show originally that I wrote with my writing partner, Oshin Kearney. Yeah. Um, I says, Oshin, I've got an idea. We're going to put on a show. And then... We just got, had a few pints, because I didn't have any good ideas. Had a few pints, and I started saying, telling him, he already knew the story, he's a friend of mine from uni. Yeah. And I said, do you remember the time I had the big ball? God, that was mad, wasn't it? Oh, that was, can't believe I didn't tell anyone. And he just turns to me and goes, you write that play. I says, Oshin, no one's going to want to hear me talk about my testicles. <laughs> and for the past three years, I've done nothing but talk yeah. about my testicles. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it was at the Edinburgh Festival, it was a massive hit. How did your family react when they saw it? <laughs> not, not your bull, but yeah. the, <laughs> but the, 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 the stage the play. play yes, yeah, so the stage play is quite, you know, it's quite energetic. It's quite fun. I, I play myself in it and play my mum and all this. And there are certain stage directions. It's a play about testicles as a teenager. Yeah. There's a stage direction in it where it says, says Mick masturbates. That's that's in the play. And I wrote the play on like a, a weekend, it's like a writer's retreat with other writers and things like that. And they were all saying, oh, your mum's going to love it. They had heard the draft. Your mum's going to adore it. Oh, it's like it's a love letter to your mum. It's a love letter to you, like, thanking your dad and your mum and everything. It's so sweet. It's so lovely. And I sat down and I read it for her. And she didn't speak to me for a week. Oh. 
and I thought, oh, you know, you're not happy with the portrayal. You're not happy with like how I'm representing you and dad yeah. and all. She just goes, you're not doing that filth on any stage. <laughs> Because of the stage direction, yeah. Michael masturbates. Yeah. And I says, but it's all about you and how much whoa, I love whoa, you. Whoa, whoa, don't say it like that. <laughs> don't say <laughs> that. <laughs> no, it's not a, it's not a thing with that. Yeah. It's about you, it's thanking you and all. And she goes, I didn't hear a word after you said that stage direction. Right. So, but no, and then afterwards, you know, she came to see the play. Did she? I think she's seen it about, you know, we've done the show over a hundred times now. Oh, wow. We might bring it back after the TV show. But she must Airs. be so immensely proud now. I imagine yeah. now when she's watching you, when you're masturbating, I bet she's <laughs> <laughs> sat there really like, I'm really happy. <laughs> no, she still closes her eyes. Does um, she? I mean, she's, I think well, she's that's probably the play, for the best. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's a TV show. Nice TV show, yeah, which is, is crazy again. Um, and it's going to be on BBC Three in the iPlayer. Yeah, so it's not out yet, but it'll be out very soon. I think what's great about a story like this, hopefully, it's if there's anyone in a similar situation, it yeah. inspires them to go, right, I'm going to go to the hospital to the doctors so they don't go through that three years. Three years, of yeah. Fear. Of fear. And that's really something we're really proud of. Yeah. It wasn't something that we intended. We were just like, we're going to write this play about my balls, and that'll be funny. Yeah, but that's but, it. But, it, yeah. but it's but, really funny, but really kind of educational. And in, in, yeah. in, in, you know, there's a better way of putting this, but in a non wanky way. <laughs> because, but yeah, do you know what exactly I mean? Right. It's, yeah. it's sort of, a, it's every day, and it's exactly, you swatch it on, you kind of go, oh, you know, everyone will you know, have a little feel of their balls yeah. <laughs> and go, no, but, no, but, you know and, but no, but the number of men who've come up to us after the play, when we've toured around Ireland or Edinburgh, wherever, have come up to us and said, do you know what, I actually had a, had a thing like that, I didn't tell anyone, yeah. I didn't tell anyone, and they were like, I'm going straight to the doctors Exactly, and, yeah. And that really, is, that's amazing, like, that's it's, not something yeah. we were intending, but it's so, makes me so happy, you know. It's brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Michael Patrick. <laughs> the break for this. I went up to OJ Simpson, yep. and I, the only way I could get his attention was shouting, we love you, OJ, because he had all these burly security people. Yeah. And he turned to me, and he signed a piece of paper, which I opened up, and it said, I did it. <laughs> um, you know. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs>Welcome back to the show. My second guest this week is a British comedy legend. Armando Manucci is the comedy mastermind behind some of the most iconic comedies of the last 25 years, including The Day to Day, Crazed Wolves in Store, A Bad Mistake, Admit Mother Care, Alan Partridge, Smell My Children, oh. Mother! The Thick of It, I don't need to keep my head down because unlike yourself, I don't give blowjobs to truckers, and Veep. I'm not gonna die because I got the heart and the quad of a high school cheerleader who's only done anal. Now, he brings us his latest project, The Personal History of David Copperfield. Please welcome my guest, Armando Anichi! Thank you, Hello, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much. For coming uh, on the show. Thank you. All week I've been thinking, how do I sit on this without losing my composure? It's I thought you of... did very well. Thank you very much. You, well, you lowered yourself very gently. Who am I sitting on? Who's... Who? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like my parrot. My parrot has newspaper. And we take great care just positioning, like, a photo of Theresa May or Boris Johnson. Uh, <laughs> where he shits. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. so do you, um... <laughs> Uh, of all the pets that you'd have, I, I, I don't imagine a parrot. Uh, he's a yes. Very, he's very lucky. <laughs> presumably, the conversations going on in your house must be exquisite. Oh, yes. Well, the parrot's called Tucker, and we, we're, <laughs> we've been trying to take, train him to say, uh, fuck Trump, and he refuses to talk, but yeah. we still spend about an hour every morning just saying, fuck Trump, <laughs> knowing that it's not going in the parrot's ears, but it, just, just to kind of get it out, really. Just... <laughs> As a sort of breakfast therapy. Right? Yeah, I like it though. Yeah. Look, like you're always working. Yeah, always. So, so you're working on scripts, but you're also yeah. trying to teach a parrot. Yeah. Satire. Because when, <laughs> when I die, I'd like the parrot to take over. Yeah. <laughs> it's such an honour to, uh, to have you on the show, genuinely. Oh, thank you. Thank but you I, I really mean that, like, you know, uh, Partridge, the day to day. When I was at college, mm. if you hadn't 
made these great comedies, me and my mates would have had nothing to talk about. Oh, no! But it must be... Do, do, do people come up and say that to you often? About once a month, somebody comes up and goes, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the laughs. <laughs> and that's fine. That's absolutely yeah. fine. And did you know when you were working with people like Chris Morris and Steve Coogan that, you know, that this is magic? Yeah, I mean, it was all... Uh, you know, Chris Morris, I heard on the radio doing these sort of parodies of radio news, and I was doing this radio news parody, so I thought, get him. Yeah. Steve Coogan did voices for Spitting Image, but he was recommended as someone who could improvise. And, and actually, I remember when we started doing On The Hour, the, the radio show, yeah. we wanted... I said to him, we, we need a sort of generic sports presenter. Yeah. So not an, not an impression, not David Coleman or John Watson, as they then were. Um, just a generic, and he came out with, I can't do the voice. I yeah. mean, Steve does it better than me, obviously. Uh, that's why he's ten times richer. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, but he came up with this kind of, you know, you join me, kind of Alan Partridge. And instantly, it, it, it was like a live. It was born yeah. kind of as Alan pa It was like when a, when a horse gives birth to a foal. Yeah. And it sort of stands up straight away and yeah. waddles around. That, Alan Partridge was born with a microphone and his jacket and... And were you, like, like deliriously excited to get it out to the world? Yeah, we just thought it was just very funny. I mean, we didn't expect it to kind of become this huge thing, what, 25 years yeah. later, still going. Yeah. Um, what was it like, kind of, just sat around? Were you, like, pretending to be Partridge all day? Um, well, the, you... way we, the way we write, Alan, is that Steve is Alan Partridge, right? Yeah. So we will fire questions at him and he will... Re I mean, he's an amazing improviser, so he'll respond as Alan. And then we might think of a new phrase to go with it and give it to him and so on. Um, but the thing is, you can only do that for so long and then you go mad because you realise you're not working with Steve, you're working with Alan Partridge. Yeah. Which is fine to talk about for, like, something you did for a day, but after six months of it, you do go absolutely mad yeah. because... Because one of Alan's things is he doesn't stop talking. That's one of his... He's a broadcaster. And just, just hearing non-stop Alan for eight to ten hours a day, five, sometimes six days a week, yeah. for six months, can go... It can make you go crazy. Yeah. It feels like that's how you can interrogate war criminals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Guantanamo Bay, they're pumping out Alan Partridge. <laughs> You join me? No! <laughs> yeah, no! I, I did I confess. <laughs> I confess. We're gonna... Uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't say what they're gonna do, because that's top secret. Um, <laughs> but, yes. And I, I didn't know that, but at the beginning of your career, you worked in radio. Yes. And you were, like, a, a prank caller. Is that right? Uh, you used to <laughs> prank people? I, right, I used to prank people. I did, I, yeah, but they were deliberately terrible pranks. Oh, OK. They were, like... I mean, my best one was on Friday Night Armistice. I went up to O.J. Simpson, yep. and I, the only way I could get his attention was shouting, we love you, O.J., because he had all these burly security people. Yeah. And he turned to me, and he signed a piece of paper which I opened up and it said, I did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty good. Did you, presumably, you didn't show it to him. Uh, no, I didn't show it to him. I, I saw it. Say, if, you... if he was there, I turned to the camera like that. So he thought I was proudly showing off his autograph, right. really. Um, <laughs> yes, I've been in hiding ever since. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to So you've got a film out, The yes. Personal History of David Copperfield. It's, uh, yes. it's at cinemas now. Yes. I think we've actually got a clip of it here as well. Ooh. Bye, Daisy. Don't wave at anyone. You were staring slightly. Is there something wrong with me? No, goodness me, no. I, I apologise for my rudeness. Oh. He is apologising, Jeff. Shall we forgive him? <laughs> he says we shall. <laughs> Thank you, Chip. Think nothing of it, sir. He speaks very well. It was actually me. <laughs> I like to pretend he speaks. Some people think it idiotic. Oh, no. I, I, I do it myself, all the time. Uh, don't I, Mr... Apple tree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, David Copperfield. Are you still being the tree? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what... 
Because when I think of you, I think of you first and foremost as a kind of a satirist. Right. And deeply kind of yeah. political and funny. So what drew you to Dickens? The, well, Dickens is very funny. We, we think of Dickens <coughs> as being very kind of, you know, this old fashioned, long winded novelist from the Victorian era who, who wrote about grime and mud and, and all that. Yes, and he did. But actually, his, his books are really, really funny and very, very modern. There's a line in David Copperfield where uh, David talks about Uriah Heep, played by Ben Wishaw in the film, who's very, he always invades your personal space and gets right up close to you. And David says, he's so close to you, he's nearer than your own shirt. And that's, that's a gag. Yeah, that's yeah. a one-liner, mm. really. And, and Dickens sort of really popularised this. And, and he wrote these novels in, in monthly and weekly editions, and they became these enormous bestsellers. So he was like, by the time he was 24, 25, he was the most famous writer in the world, and he was celebrated all around the world. But he liked having a big mass audience, because it then meant he could talk about issues like, you know, poverty or um, homelessness, which you get in David Copperfield, debt, or um, child labour, which, of course, you get in, in Oliver Twist. So he was really someone who uh, used the platform that he had mm. to then talk about the issues of the day. So it's not that much different sure. from, from now. Yeah. Um, and, and I just thought, um, I mean, I've always grown up, like you said, that you, you, you were inspired by, you know, watching comedy stuff. Mm. I was inspired by reading Charles Dickens, right. you know, and he's such a funny writer that I just wanted to make this, this film. So and did you feel like a pressure to kind of to get that to the film, or did, did it feel kind of easy that you go... Well, I, I felt that the thing I didn't want to do was, like, I said to the cast, the crew, when we make this, let's pretend no-one's ever made a costume drama before, and therefore there are no rules. Yeah. Let's just make it the way we want. I, I want no cobbles and no dames. I just want to do it our way. Yeah. And I, I, I asked the actors, you know, the moment somebody puts on a top hat and a coat, they start talking like this, right. sir, yeah. as if... No, I said, don't do that. Just, just talk like this. Just yeah. be yourself. Because even though it's set in 1840, for them, for those characters there, that's their present day. Mm. They're in the present. You know, when they pick up a book, it's not covered in cobwebs. Yeah. Because it's not 150 years old. Mm. They bought it last week. So it, it's, it's all about that. And then we try... And then that scene you saw there, we, 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 we just, like, played about in rehearsals. But that so. feels like that could have been on Love Island. Well, you know, but, but like, as yes. in, like, that, that timeless awkwardness between kind of... Yeah, attention. absolutely. I haven't watched Love Island, though. You have, you've never Tell watched... me about... What is this Love Island? I, uh, well, I've only seen it from the kitchen, so my, okay. wa my, <laughs> my wife is yeah. a doctor, and yes. the way that she relaxes is to watch absolute trash. And right. from, from what I can see is Ken dolls with genitals. Yes. And... <laughs> Uh, ladies, as they should be. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, ladies with all sorts. No, no, we're out. Bre no, we've got Brexit. Yeah. Ken dolls will have genitals. Exactly, yeah. None of this <laughs> European. Yeah, exactly, Mike. Just smoothie edges. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they'll have pubes everywhere. Oh but... yeah. <laughs> but there'll be British pubes. They will. There'll be. <laughs> there'll be Union Jack pubes. Yeah, basically, um, uh, pretty people uh, yeah. are, are on an island. And they talk to each other. Yes. And they try and couple up. Yes. And then people watching don't like it when some people get together, and then others they like it when they do get together. Right. So it's it's like a sort of peace process kind it, of. Yes. UN. It's like the UN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh -huh. the Trump kind of Israeli plan that's come out this week that's that was done on Love Island. Well, sort a version of sort that. Of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they had to do Jaeger bombs. Okay. And. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the vibe. <laughs> but it's like if you if you if you desperately want your brain to switch off, that's an yes. excellent okay. way. <laughs> now, there was a great story the other day that you uh, you tweeted about about Trump. Trump. That's yes. just beautiful See, this. <laughs> so I think we've got the tweet here. Right. I just yeah. thought, oh, here's a funny idea, and I just tweeted this, yeah. So do you want to read it or film should... pitch? Yeah. Drub Trump drugged and moved to a replica White House where he carries on thinking he's governing. <laughs> Millions spent on hiring actors to play his staff, senators, news anchors, people at rallies. There you go, studios, your highest bid, please. Yeah. <laughs> now, as... Exactly. <laughs> OK. So... Well, that was a joke. Yes. And you've since had... Well, that day, I got 12 offers from 12 studios. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of incredible, isn't it? I know. It? And part of me was kind of excited and part of me was really disgusted that, you know, it was that easy, you yeah. know, that they were kind of leaping on it. That yeah, easy. but it's because it's so simple. It, yeah. And yet... 
I could sort of see it. Yeah. And it may well already be happening. That's the other this thing. This is it. You know. <laughs> but what a job. Whoever gets that, I'd like to put myself in, in the ring for whoever does drug him. Yes. You know those... <laughs> How would you do it? You blowpipe. Oh, right. You know, like... <laughs> you thought this through. Go on. Oh, but can you imagine What's that? in it? What's in the blowpipe? I don't know what poison. Horse tranquilizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But proper, like... <laughs> Yeah. Like, just to catch... That's there. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's your money shot. Yeah. And then, a bit like, you see those awful, terrible people that kind of pose with dead lions they've killed. <laughs> like, <laughs> I kind of see myself like, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be quite good fun, but... <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> just kind of... Just, just moving his head. Yeah, yeah. Moving his head to say sensible things, yeah. you know. <laughs> Yeah. That is a wonderful thing yeah. to do. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. go see David Copperfield. It's great. Please give it up for the fantastic Armando yeah. Anucci! Yeah. 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 Now it's time for Good Deeds and a brilliant project which is using buses to help the homeless. Hi, I'm Dan, founder of Buses for Homeless. We're a low-cost solution to homelessness, creating eating, sleeping, learning and well-being spaces on double-decker buses. I used to run a company that upcycled buses for private and corporate events. I met my friend Sim when we were working at the same bus yard. One day I walked in to find him sleeping rough where you put your luggage under a coach. I was homeless, living in the coaches, trying not to upset the boss. There was obviously only one solution. Out of my bus. <laughs> Kitted it out and him and his three dogs lived in there. And now he's back on his feet, he's on full-time employment with a roof over his head. And if it worked for Sim, then why wouldn't it work for other people? Wave to the world, Sim. <laughs> and, and don't pull the bird either, you old bugger. <laughs> Ever since then, I've been thinking and doing a lot more research and understanding homelessness. So, in 2018, I slept rough for a night. I'm so cold. How anybody can sleep. Or just live on the streets. Things from that moment started happening. We've just had donated our first ever double-decker bus. We've got some amazing helpers. We have light! We have good news. Our own permanent site. We will be able to welcome our first group of guests on board. I can't believe how far it's come in such a short period of time. Yeah, just the crazy stuff that was in my head is actually coming to fruition. <laughs> Woo! We've got six guys at the moment coming through the program. We're slightly different to most day centers or night shelters. We focused on their mental well-being and job training, but most importantly, saving up a deposit so they've got enough money to get into a house and be stood on their own two feet. Our project manager, Jason, was homeless no more than 12 months ago. And now all he wants to do is help other homeless people follow in his footsteps. A few years ago, I had a fleet of vans and staff. Yeah, we had it all, but um, alcohol and, and, and drugs got the better of me. I'm very strong about recovery now. I'm six months clean, and the future's bright, you know? It's been tough on the road. I'd normally ride the night buses, stay on it from end to end. But now, thank God, I don't have to do that. It seems like everything's going to work out. We're working on a long-term solution to homelessness, and it works. Four of the guys have been given job offers already. We want to expand this model up and down the country, and with your help, we can make it happen. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching the show. Good night, my friends. Good night.